the video this time, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, instead of doing several example problems, I'm going to actually introduce a new concept. This is a concept that's a little bit off to the side of the main idea of what we're talking about in the class, but it's actually a pretty important one, and it's one that it's one that's actually shown up a little bit already, and it's one that will show up again. And this is the concept of reference frames. Or a frame of reference. Now, this is a term you've probably heard in everyday parlance before, um, talking about how two different people don't agree on certain ideas because they're coming from a different frame of reference. That's a metaphor. What we're talking about here in physics actually has a really precise definition. So a reference frame is something that you can measure positions and velocities relative to. Um, so, so great, okay. So what is a reference frame? What makes some things a reference frame? How do we think about a reference frame? So I'm going to start with an example, and it's an example that, that showed up in one of these videos before. It is an example that's shown up in class, and that is the crate on the flatbed truck. So let's start with, um, let's just suppose that the truck has done some accelerating or something, but now the truck is moving at a constant speed v, but that the crate, because of what has happened in the past, is actually sliding towards the back of the truck. So what that means is if the crate is moving at some speed v, where v is less than capital V. So capital V I'm using for the speed of the truck right here. All right, so the crate is moving forward, but it's moving forward at a slower speed. So if you just sort of track what happens in time as the, as the truck moves along, as the truck moves along, the crate's not keeping up with it, and eventually the crate's going to fall off of the back of the truck. So that's what will happen as a result of this. Well, okay, um, I could also ask the question, what is the speed or what is the velocity? I could ask either question of the crate relative to the truck. And what does that really mean? Well, all we do is we just say um, the speed of the crate relative to the truck, so I'll say CRT for crate relative to the truck, is just going to be the speed of the crate, or rather the velocity, the x component of velocity of the, tra of, of the crate minus the x component of the velocity of the truck. This will come out to a negative number. So what we could do is we could imagine that the truck itself is at rest, and then the crate is moving with speed, or rather with velocity, vCRT, in the negative x direction. So speed CRT, and then the velocity points in the negative x direction, assuming x is horizontal here. So in this frame of reference, the truck is at rest, the crate is moving that way, and let's just imagine a tree by the side of the road. Go ahead with my brown pen. I wanted to make it the tree with a nice brown trunk, and I didn't find it. So imagine that there is a tree by the side of the road here. All right. That is at rest on the earth, so the truck's going by. Well, in the truck's frame of reference, of course, the tree is going to be moving that way with speed capital V. Right. And in fact, the whole earth it gets a little complicated because the earth is round and things like that, but what really the ground in the area where the truck is is moving that way with speed v. So that's what things would look like in the truck's frame of reference. We have the truck at rest, and the crate is sliding off the back, and the tree is moving past that way. Um, if you want to see a nice example of this, um, Google search or search on YouTube for the following top secret train gag. It's just about two minutes long, and it's a clip from the movie Top Secret, which came out in the early 80s at some point, which is a very silly comedy movie having to do with spies in World War II and World War I, and it wasn't 100% sure about when it took place, actually. But this is a fun little train gag that gives you a nice visual sense of this relative motion sort of thing. So, great. Okay, so that's, that's the idea of um, a reference frame. So then the question is, how do we actually define this to make it a little more rigorous, and how do we do the math with all of it? So here's a way I want you to visualize reference frames. I want you to think of reference frame, one reference frame as being like an axis. So we will have an X and a Y and a Z and that axis defines a reference frame. 
Well, okay, now we've already seen that X, Y, and Z are not universal, that, that you don't have to have Y be up. Sometimes we make Z up. That, that you can choose as long as, here's the, here's the requirements, X, Y, and Z all have to be more mutually perpendicular, and you need to make sure that X cross Y is Z. As long as you've satisfied those two requirements, your X, Y, Z axes, you can orient them any way you want. You can put the origin, where is X equals zero, Y equals zero, and Z equals zero, anywhere you want. And so one example of where we use that is if something's moving down a slope. So instead of a crate this time, I'm gonna make it a bicycle which doesn't have a rider, so one wonders how it's stable, but whatever. Um, there's a bicycle going down a slope. Well, it's very convenient in this case to define our axes something like this for lots of reasons, because then the, the normal force of the ground pushing up on the bicycle wheels is in the y direction, the acceleration of the bike, and the velocity in this case is entirely in the x direction. So you're already familiar with the notion that we are allowed to define um, axes oriented however we want for the convenience of our problem. And in fact, if you remember the wedge problem, so the wedge problem was the one like this, where you have two different angles that I called theta and phi, and there's a block and a pulley and another block. And if you looked at the way I solved this problem, I actually defined two sets of axes. So I defined x and y like this, with a z like that. And I defined x prime and y prime and z prime like that, because it actually made it easier to analyze things, because now this block is accelerating entirely in the x prime direction, but this block is accelerating entirely in the x direction. And so you take all the quantities relative to this block, so the, its normal force, which is that way, its gravity, its acceleration, its friction, if you have any, and you write out their components in the primed frame, the x prime, y prime, z prime, over here you write out in the x, y, z frame. So this is a case where it's possible to use two different sets of axes, and you notice I'm using the term frame here. These are really two different reference frames, sorta, but they certainly are two different sets of axes, and I could, in principle, break any vector into the components in either set of axes, and so I just pick the one that's convenient in each case. I have to be very careful that I don't say, oh, this x component and this x component mean the same thing. So if this guy is accelerating that way, it's x, the x component of his acceleration is positive, and the y and z components of his acceleration are zero, but the x prime component is not necessarily positive, and the y prime component of this guy's acceleration is not zero, so that wouldn't be helpful. So, you know, you use them where you want. But this is an example of where we actually had two different sets of axes to analyze the same problem. Well, so what we're going to do with reference frames is not just think about axes that maybe are rotated relative to each other, but actually axes that move relative to each other. So I'm going to have this will be my x, y, and z axes, and then my x prime, y prime, and z prime axes. Now the notation gets a little messy, I should just warn you, because sometimes prime looks like to the first power. I used to be a little careful with that. But the x prime, y prime, and z prime axes will be moving relative to the unprimed axes. So again, as an example of where you might use this, I'm going to bring my flatbed truck back. Probably shouldn't even have erased it. Um, the flatbed truck you can think of as having the x prime, y prime, and z prime axes nailed to it. And then the x, y, and z axes are nailed to the ground. So the x prime, y prime, and z prime axes are moving with the speed of the truck relative to the ground. So most of the time when you have two different reference frames, the reason you do it is because something you care about is moving with some velocity relative to whatever reference frame you started with, and that thing you care about, it becomes convenient to define a reference frame in which that thing is at rest. So in this problem, it's convenient to come up with a reference frame in which the truck is at rest. All right. So, so that's how you pick your reference frame. Just like that, the reference frame does not have to be at rest. Yes, okay. Here's another example of where you might want to use this idea. Let's suppose that I've given you a very simple ballistic problem. You know, one person has a ball, 
this person throws the ball, another person catches the ball, and I'm asking, this second person is very tall, and I'm asking you questions like, if the person throws the ball at some angle theta, how hard does he need to throw it so that it gets to the person? How long does it take to get to this person? And we did all this kind of stuff back earlier in the class. So that's the sort of ballistic problem you might be able to do. But now, suppose to make it more complicated, I'm putting these people on a train car. And the train car is moving that way. All right. So if you try and think about what it will look like as the train car goes by, as the train car goes by, both people are moving with the train car. This one person throws the ball, and the ball kind of moves along, but the path that the ball makes through the air is different. And in fact, this initial angle theta is different than it would have, be, would have been had the train car been at rest. So we think about, oh dear, and what if I am asking it for you to do this? If I'm asking for you to do this relative to the ground, well, you could do it. You would just have to say, okay, I'll have to figure out what this is and I'll need to subtract off this because if I'm asking you to do it relative to the ground, but then how hard does he have to throw it? Well, from his point of view, he throws the ball relative to him. So how hard eh, has to do with him. But I could ask what's the V0 relative to the ground as a vector. And I could ask how far does the ball go relative to the ground. And I could ask what is its velocity before it hits relative to ground. I could do all of this, but now Deciding what the condition is for the ball to get from here to here is no longer what is this distance. But what I would have to do is set up an equation of motion for this guy. So I could say, like, here's the receiver guy. I'll call him R for receiver. And I could say the X of the receiver, let's say that the distance they start apart is X0. Uh, let's not call it X0. Let's call it uh, D. Because I want to save x0 for, for initial positions of things. So xr is equal to d plus capital V times t. So at t equals 0, this guy is right. So what I'm saying is at t equals 0, this guy is at position 0. And then I could figure out the equation of motion for the ball. So I would get equation of the ball is going to equal, in the grounds frame of reference, whatever the x component of the ball is. So the ball starts at position 0 plus the x component of the ball times t. And then I would insist that these two things be equal to each other. Not too hard, right? But it would be easier if I could just say, when is this, when is x of the ball equal to d? And you say, oh, well, that's d over vx for t. That was much easier, right? Well, OK, so then what you might decide that you want to do is, well, let's just do it in the train's frame of reference. It becomes a much simpler ballistics problem. And we'll just do the conversions when we're done, back to the other frame of reference. So there is an advantage in working in different frames of reference. And in fact, there's nothing fundamental whatsoever about the Earth as a frame of reference, right? If I talk about, well, how fast is it going? It turns out in physics there is this thing called the principle of relativity. You may have heard of this guy, Einstein. He had hair issues. And the principle of relativity says that to talk about the velocity of something, it always has to be relative to something. Uh, you know, so if you're watching Star Trek, which I realize this is like 30 years ago, none of you were at least 20 years ago? No, the late 80s. It's almost 30 years ago. And so none of you guys know this. But if, you know, if, if Picard says, uh, you know, all stop, data should say, well, with respect to what, sir? Because velocity is not defined in an absolute sense. And so you have to tell me with respect to what. And yeah. So, right. So velocity is not defined in an absolute sense. There's no such thing as the absolute speed of something. It's just not a real thing in physics. It always has to be relative to something. Now, in this class, we have almost always, for most of our problems, talked about the speed relative to the Earth, because that's the most natural thing to do when you're working on the Earth. It's just the big thing all around us. It's the natural frame of reference to use, so it's what we use. But there's nothing fundamental about that. And in fact, if you think about looking down on the Earth, the Earth sucks, but that's not the kind of looking down I'm talking about. If you think of looking down on the Earth, right, so here's the North Pole here, right there, it's shrinking, and here's a little polar bear trying to sink on the shrinking ice. Um, and then you have various continents around, which I'm not going to try and draw right. So you have various continents around. So let's suppose this is uh, North America here. That's supposed to be Florida. That's supposed to be Central America. It's terrible, I know. And here we are in New Wilmington. Well, over the course of the day, Harry, I'm looking down on this. Over the course of the day, we actually rotate around like this. Once every 24 hours, we make a rotation like this. And as a result of that motion, the Earth is rotating, right? That's why the sun rises and sets. 
As a result of that motion, we are moving at something like 350 meters per second. The people on the equator are moving even faster. So then what business do we have treating this as the reference frame, knowing it's moving at 350 meters per second? Oh, well, why not? Because we can, and it's easier that way. It gets even worse than that. Um, you know, at the center of the solar system, there's this thing we call the sun. And I hope all of you know that the Earth goes around the sun. Apparently, lots of Americans don't know that nowadays, and that's a very sad thing. But the Earth goes around the sun. Although you might say, well, isn't there a reference frame in which the sun is going around the Earth? I say, yeah, but it's a problematic reference frame. So the Earth goes around the sun, and it turns out that the speed of the Earth as it goes around the sun is 30 kilometers per second. So that's 30,000 meters per second. Hold on to something, right? Because you're going to fall over. My, are we tooling along. This is still a lot less than the speed of light. You know, we're a factor of 10 to the 4 down from the speed of light. So it's nothing. But compared to the kinds of speeds we talk about for everyday things, that's really fast. But we don't notice it. Why? Because everything around us, even with this speed, everything around us, the air, the trees, the ground, the buildings, are all moving at the same speed. So in a sense, we feel like we're in that frame of reference. Everything around us is moving at the same velocity, even not just the same speed. Everything around us is moving at the same velocity along with us. So relative to the things around us, if I'm standing still, I'm at rest. And so that becomes the natural reference frame to use. So this reference frame that we often use that's fixed, where, where, where it's at rest relative to the Earth, is actually not really a fundamental thing. And when we talk about what is the velocity implied relative to the Earth, well, it might make more sense actually to talk about what is it relative to the solar system and subtract out the motion of the Earth's orbit and the motion of the Earth's rotation, and that would get much more complicated, so we don't do that. So the point of all this is, is that reference frames aren't really fundamental. There's no one reference frame that is fundamental. But there are, for, for a given system, there become some reference frames that are kind of the natural ones to use, and if you're dealing with stuff near the surface of the Earth, the reference frame of the surface of the Earth is a natural one to use. Now there's another wrinkle having to do with this that I will come back to at the end. So, okay. So f next, how do you actually transform between frames? Well, there's one thing I do want to say before that, is that if you choose another reference frame to put in your problem, you really want to choose a reference frame that's moving at a constant velocity relative to whatever your rest frame is. Right? So if the rest frame, or whatever the initial reference frame, sometimes we call this the lab frame, because it's, uh, the idea is it's a scientist in a laboratory. If this is the frame of reference of the Earth, and so you want to choose reference frames that are moving at constant velocity relative to whatever your standard reference frame is. If the velocity is changing, things get much more complicated. Okay, so you want a constant velocity reference frame. Um, what that means is that, for example, if you have a ball at the end of the string going around, you don't want to use the reference frame of the ball. You could pick a reference frame that's moving in that direction with a speed that happens to exactly match the ball's speed so that very briefly the ball is at rest in that frame. You could pick a frame like that, it'd be a little more complicated to think about, but you could. But if you pick a frame where the ball is always at rest, because the ball's velocity is changing, that means the ball is accelerating, right? It's accelerating towards the center of the circle. That is not a reference frame moving at a constant velocity. So you want to pick reference frames moving at constant velocity. And now is when you might say, wait a minute. Remember the sun? And remember what the Earth is doing relative to the sun? It's going around in a circle, which means that any reference frame that is at rest on the Earth, doot, doot, x, y, z, is in fact not moving at a constant velocity relative to you know, the sun. It's, this actually is an accelerated reference frame. Uh oh, and it turns out that the rotation of the Earth actually makes a bigger difference. Even though the speed is higher, um, the acceleration is higher because of the rotation of the Earth as we go around. And so the rotation of the Earth means that these reference frames we've been using all along at rest aren't really good, I'll give you the jargon term, inertial. This is the jargon frame for a reference frame that's moving at a constant velocity. And so a reference frame at rest relative to the Earth is not an inertial reference frame. Oh no! But it's close enough. 
that all of our physics works. If you've ever heard of things like the Coriolis effect, um, which is uh, if you shoot a cannonball far enough, its, its path will bend a little bit. Um, that is a result of the fact that the Earth is a rotating reference frame. Uh, there's all, yeah, so there's some effects like that, and, and on large scales, Coriolis effects can actually slightly affect motions of currents that eventually give rise to hurricanes and cyclones and things like that. So it can matter on really long scales, but the kind of throwing balls around and driving cars we've been talking around in this class, the Earth's reference frame is close enough to an inertial frame that it's good. So with that warning aside, you're going to have this reference frame. You want to make sure any other reference frame you use is moving at a constant velocity relative to the one you started with. So, how do you do the math of all this? Turns out you've actually already kind of seen it, because relative velocity, you're just going to subtract off of velocity. But I want to be a little more careful about this. So, if you have a velocity vector, Vx, just as when I had the, uh, remember the two reference frames for uh, going up and coming down the wedge, you could write the um, components in either set of coordinates if you have something like a velocity vector, you can write the components of that vector in different reference frames. And so the notation starts to get a little bit troublesome. And so what ends up happening is, is you really want to work with components because working with vectors as a whole becomes a little bit uh, difficult. So here's the way it works. If I have some object, so I'm going to make a ball, and it's moving with some velocity v. And you notice this v is not, it's not at rest in this frame. It's certainly not at rest in this frame because that and that are not the same. If I had an object whose V was exactly the same as this, it would be at rest in this frame, like the truck frame. But this one is not. And suppose I know, uh, let's suppose in this case, so this is, this is like the train example, where I figured out how the ball is moving on the train. So if I know the components in this frame, how do I find the components in this frame? So the idea is that I know Vx prime, Vy prime, and Vz prime. Right, so I have to not just say Vx, Vy, Vz, but Vx prime, Vy prime, Vz prime, because those are the components of the velocity in this frame. Okay? How do I find the components of the velocity in the ground frame, or whatever the unprimed frame is? Here's how it works. Vx is going to equal, and now you can just kind of think about this. If this object, if you're on the train, okay, on the train you throw the ball like that, but on the ground, the train is moving this way. That means the ball is going that way, right? On the train, the ball is just going to make that arc. On the ground, it's going to make this arc. So if you just think about it, what I have to do is I have to start with Vx prime, and I add capital Vx, right? The easiest one to think about is the case where Vx prime is 0. That is something that's at rest in this frame. What is its speed relative to this? Oh, you know, assuming this is moving entirely the way I've drawn it. If something's at rest in this frame and capital V is all in the x direction, then its velocity in this frame is just going to be capital V in the x direction, right? So if Vx prime is 0, I get little Vx is equal to capital Vx. And so all three of them work the same way. Vy is equal to Vy prime plus Vy. And Vz is equal to Vz prime plus capital Vz. That's basically all there is to it. Right? That's how you go between one frame and another. If I knew the x, y, and z frames, all I have to do is just solve these. If I knew the x, y, and z components, I can just solve these, and I could do the transformation in this direction. So I'm calling this, it's a frame transformation. right? I'm going from one frame of reference to another. Vy prime is just equal to Vy minus capital V. That should have been capital Vx, Vy. And Vz prime is just equal to Vz minus capital Vz. So this way you can go either direction. And this here is sort of capturing the idea, what is this? If this is the frame of reference of the truck, this is the velocity of the crate relative to the ground, this is the relative velocity between the crate and the truck. Subtraction just like we've seen before. So this is how you would do the transformations of velocities. Now you have to think about positions also. Um, the transformations of the positions makes a difference as well. Why does this matter? Well, let's just ima imagine that I have my unprimed frame here, and then I have my primed frame here. Sorry, I want this to be the unprimed frame. And my primed frame 
And now imagine an object that is at the origin in the unprimed frame. Sorry, in the prime frame, I keep saying it wrong. An object here, here's a ball, it is at rest at the origin of the prime frame, but the prime frame is moving that way with velocity v, well, speed v in the plus x prime or the plus x direction. Let me also, just for convenience, let's say at t equals zero, x prime is x, y prime is y, and z prime is z. What that means is t equals zero is when these two origins are exactly lined up. So we were just choosing for convenience. You don't have to do it this way, but for convenience, it's nice to choose at t equals zero to have the two origins lined up. So, um, so then, if you want to figure out, if suppose I know x, I want to find x prime or vice versa, here's the way it would work. I would say x prime is equal to x minus capital V times t. So if you think about plugging in t equals zero, you will get x prime equals x, as expected. But as time goes by, right, if x prime stays constant here, v times t is going up, 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 up. So x also has to go up, 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 up to keep x prime constant, say, zero. So if x prime is zero, then x will just equal capital V times t, as expected. So that's the transformation. So, and this should be, uh, that should have been Vx times t. Likewise, y prime is going to equal y minus Vy t, and z prime is going to equal z minus Vz t, right? So these things here all together are called either the Galilean, uh, this whole thing is called Galilean relativity, not to be confused with Einstein's special relativity, where these equations become much more complicated, and it's really cool, but we're not doing that here. Um, this is sometimes also called Newtonian relativity because it all works in Newtonian mechanics, which is what we're studying in this class. And these are the Galilean transformations. This is how you go from the unprimed frame to the prime frame, and if you have to go backwards, just solve it the other way around. So there they are for the velocities. You could very easily do that for the positions as well. So those are the equations to transform from one frame of reference to another. So the last thing I want to... Whoa, my shirt changed. How did that happen? Anyway, uh, the last thing I want to talk about is a specific frame of reference that turns out to be useful in the kinds of problems we're talking about in class right now. And that is the center of momentum frame. Now, you've heard of center of mass, hopefully. Center of mass is it's like the balance point. It's sort of the average of where all the mass is. So center of momentum is the frame of reference at which... Uh, the system has net zero momentum. So I'll tell you the definition first and then I'll give you a couple of examples to hopefully make it make sense. So we're talking about the center of momentum frame. So the way you calculate that is first you calculate the total momentum of the whole system. So remember momentum is a vector. The momentum of one object is just equal to its mass times its velocity as a vector. The total momentum of your whole system is then going to be the sum of this for each object in the system. That's all there is to it. So then what we're going to do is we're going to find the velocity of the center of momentum frame, which I'll call VCM, and it's nothing more than the momentum of the whole system divided by the mass of the whole system, right? So you can see that this kind of makes sense, that if the mass of the total system times the velocity of the center of mass is the momentum of the whole system. Okay, that seems pretty logical. So that's that's basically all there is to it. And then you can find, as usual, you can find the Vx prime. So let's assume that x prime is now is in the CM frame, the center of momentum frame. That's what prime means now, for, for right now. It's just going to be equal to Vx minus Vcmx. You take the x component of this. Same thing, Vy prime. So it's just a standard frame transformation, only now you transfer to the center of momentum frame. Okay, and there. That's basically all there is to it. Now the advantage of the center of momentum frame, well, of course, is that the total momentum is zero. If 
you have defined your system in such a way that there are no external forces on any part of your system, then you know, and I hope I got to this in class on Wednesday, you know that the total momentum of that system will be conserved, which means that the total momentum of the system in this new frame will stay zero. Um, and it turns out that some calculations are easier to do if you are in the center of momentum frame. So it's useful to be able to go to the center of momentum frame and then back in order to do calculations and some, you know, make life easier on yourself. So let me give you a couple of simple examples of using the center of momentum frame. I'm going to start with two balls of the same mass. So I have ball M there and another ball of mass M there. I'm going to say that this mass here is moving with speed V in the plus X direction. All right, so here's my unprimed frame right there. And M is moving with speed V in the plus X direction. All right, transfer this to the center of momentum frame. All right, so how do I do that? Well, VCM is P tote over N tote. In this case, it's not very hard because this guy's momentum in the unprimed frame is zero. So VCM, which is P tote over M tote, even as a vector, I'll do the full vector to go with. Well, the total momentum is just the momentum of this guy, since this guy has no momentum. So that's going to be m v x hat, right? This v, speed v in the plus x hat direction, so I can write it like that. And then the total mass of the system is m plus m, or 2m, which when I cancel the m's, I get vcm equals v over 2 x hat. Right? So now it's very easy to do this transformation. I can get um, let's call this object 1 and this object 2. So V1X prime, so V1 and the X prime system is just V1 and the unprimed system minus the X component of the center of velocity, which in this case is V over 2, is just V over 2. And then Y and Z, I'm going to just say, look, it's 0 here. The center of mass is 0. That's going to be 0 as well. I'll do a two-dimensional example in a moment. And then V2x prime, so that's the x component of this velocity, is equal to its unprimed velocity minus the x component of the center of mass velocity is minus V over 2. So in the primed frame, what you have is this guy going that way and this guy going this way. And you see there's lots more symmetry here. So this is what it looks like. And both of these are going with speed V over 2, one in the negative x, one in the positive x direction. So this is the x prime, y prime, z prime, right? So that's an example of transferring these two balls into the center of momentum frame. Where we're going to go with this, and what we'll start seeing in class next week, is we'll, or, uh, we'll start doing collisions of these things and think about what happens when they bounce off of each other. All right. So that's an example of converting into the center of momentum frame. I'm going to do one more example that's a little more complicated. I'm going to make it more complicated in two ways, and I'm going to put numbers on it too, because I know that always makes you happy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have one ball here whose mass is, so this is m1 is equal to 1 kilogram, and he is going with speed v is equal to, what's a good choice, 2 meters per second, right? 2 meters per second in the plus x direction. So this is the unprimed frame here. And then I have another ball of mass M2, which is different. M2, this guy is heavier. I know he doesn't look bigger, but this guy's made out of a heavier material. And he's going in the plus y direction with a speed of 3 meters per second. And now what I want to do is convert this to the center of momentum frame. Well, okay, so the first thing you do to convert to the center of momentum frame, let's calculate the total momentum. So P tote, in this case, well, I have M1 V1 plus M2 V2, right? That's just, there's two objects, so that's what it's going to be. So it's M1 times, and I should have uh, put subscripts on these little guys, right? Because this V1 is not the same as this V2. So it's M1. And I'm not putting numbers in yet, right? Don't put numbers into the end. Do not plug numbers in until you're plugging all your numbers in. So it's M1 V1 X hat, right? Plus M2 V2 Y hat. Now, again, this example is still pretty simple because each one only goes in one direction. You might, uh, 
it's very easy to have things going in all directions, and eventually you'll see problems like that. So I could write this as m1 v1 comma m2 v2 comma zero. Right. So that is the um, momentum, the total momentum of the system in the unprimed frame. So now I can calculate VCM by just doing its p tote divided by m tote. Well, m tote is m1 plus m2, so this is going to be m1 over m1 plus m2 v1 comma m2 over m1 plus m2 v2 comma zero, right? So that's VCM. Now, at this point, it might be okay to put numbers in and have this VCM and then subtract them later. I'm not going to do it that way, but if you did that, that wouldn't be the most terrible thing in the world, right? The most terrible thing in the world is um, pretty awful. And this isn't that bad. So, uh, okay, so let's go on now and let's figure out what V1X prime, I don't like this green pen, so I'm not going to use it. I'm going to use red instead. Pen's just a little cheesy, okay. V1X prime, well, here's the transformation. So it's going to be V1, because that's the unprimed x component of velocity, minus m1 over m1 plus m2 v1. Ooh, scary. But I'm going to do some algebraic simplification. I'm going to put them over a common denominator. So I'll have m1 v1 plus m2 v1 right, over m1 plus m2. So that's the left side of this common denominator minus m1 v1. Hey, look, this term subtracts. That's one of the advantages. Sometimes, if you do the algebra first, you'll see that stuff simplifies before you plug numbers in. So it's so v1 x prime is m2 over m1 plus m2 v1. Okay, that's how that works out. I have to do v1 y prime though, right? Because it's not zero in this case. v1 y is zero, but vcm is not zero in the y direction, so that's minus m2 over m1 plus m2 v2, right? And I'm basically done there, so I'll write it over here just for symmetry. Okay, that's great. So that was v1. I should have done that in blue, but whatever, I didn't, so cope. And now I'm going to do v2 x prime. v2 x prime is equal to zero minus the center of mass is x component m1 over m1 plus m2 v1, right? So that's m1 over m1 plus m2 v1. And finally, v2y prime is equal to v2y here, which is just v2, minus the y component of the center of masses, center of momentum, rather, frames velocity, which is m2 over m1 plus m2 v2. The same kind of simplification will happen. I'm just going to write out the result. And what we're going to get is um, this one is the m2 terms are going to subtract out. So we'll have the m1 over m1 plus m2 times v2. And now we're done. Now we have it all. So now what I can do is I can put in numbers. So I will do that. I will plug in these numbers. So I erased all that because we have it. Just rewind your video. You'll see it. So I know that v1 in the primed frame, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this as v1 prime, indicate I'm doing the components of the vector in the primed frame, and I'm just going to write this out again. So it's m2, well, I'll go ahead and plug the numbers in. So m2 is 2 kilograms divided by, that should have had a gram on it, m1 plus m2, that's 2 kilograms plus 1 kilogram. Um, all of that times v1, which is 2 meters per second, okay, and then the y prime is m2, which is 2 kilograms, again, so we have 2 kilograms divided by 2 kilograms plus 1 kilogram, but now over here I have a v2, so that needs to be 3 meters per second, so you see it's not the same, okay, 0, all right, so if you plug those numbers in, I'm going to get well, 2 times 2 is 4 divided by 3. I'm going to get 4 thirds kilogram meters per second. 2 times 3 is 6 divided by 3 is going to be 2 kilogram meters per second, 0. So there it is. Those are the components of V1 in the center of momentum frame. And likewise, I can do V2 prime. 
So V2 prime X, I have M1 over M1 plus M2, so that's going to be 1 kilogram divided by 1 kilogram plus 2 kilograms. And then here it was multiplying V1. So V1 is just 2 meters per second. 2 meters per second. Um, I made a mistake here. Notice this had a negative sign on it, and this had a negative sign on it, and I lost them. So that should have been negative, and this here should have been negative, right? Because there was a negative there. Should have kept them. Which meant this here was negative, and this was negative. Sorry about that. So that means this here also is negative. So now V2Y prime, we go here, it's M1 over M1 plus M2, so that's the same thing. One kilogram divided by one kilogram plus two kilograms times this time V2, which is three meters per second. So now I can multiply this out. I have two thirds, because it's two divided by three, so minus two thirds meters per second. Here I have three divided by three, one meters per second, zero. And that's it. Now, something that's interesting about this, if you just look at these two numbers, notice that this, 4 thirds is negative 2 times 2 thirds, and negative 2 is negative 2 times 1. You discover that in the center of momentum frame, now having done all the calculations, I'm going to erase them. So you've got all this. I'm going to erase them so I can draw it in the center of momentum frame. Right. So for here in the center of momentum frame, so this is x prime, y prime, z prime. If let's try and draw object number one first. So one, it needs to be four thirds, and so four thirds in x and minus two in y, it's gonna be something like that. And then we have object number two here. It needs to be minus two thirds in x and one in y, it's gonna be something like that. They're coming right at each other because one's velocity is a constant, positive constant times the negative of the other. So that's what happens when you convert these into the center of momentum frame. They're coming right at each other just like what we did last time. Now what you might do if you're even willing to do more frame transformations is to make yet another frame of reference where the x component is this way and the y component is this way. We'll call this the double prime frame of reference. right? And then you can only work along the x component, but now we're really kind of going a little bit nuts. So that's a couple of examples of converting from one frame of reference to another, specifically from the starting frame, the lab frame, the earth frame, whatever you want to call it, to the center of momentum frame of reference. So you will need to use these. That's all we have for this week. I hope you enjoyed it.